as you're talking, you're talking to numerous stakeholders at the same time. You're talking to the team you just played against. You want to be respectful. You're talking to next week's opponent because they're going to try and look at every word you say. You're talking to your ownership. You're talking to your supporters. You're talking to the press, talking to your players. You've got to decide which one of those sits at the top of your list. But there's also the effect it has on the players. So their number one is being the best version of myself. How are you going to go onto that pitch and show confidence if your manager doesn't do it? Maybe in the other touchline, the manager's got his tractor bombs tucked into his socks. We'll one nil up. There was no tactics. There was nothing more than saying, just stand up for yourself and believe it. But you've got to come to work and you've got to mean it. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the Business of Sport. Thank you for having me. Look, it's uh, it's brilliant to talk to you. There are so many things uh, that, that we can cover in this session, not least how you uh, got named the most fashionable man in football, which I'm very keen to dive into. Uh, but <laughs> I, think, I think to start off with, what would be brilliant is if you could just give us a little bit of the background of you as a player before we then go and have a look at management. I, mean, I love sport generally. So probably growing, growing up, it was all football and cricket and uh, a bit of rugby and golf but especially football and cricket probably as good a cricketer as I was a footballer I sort of gave up playing seriously at about 20 and then so the MCC was a good good way to go for social cricket and access to to Lords so I've been a member there since I was 20 um but I played really serious cricket you know England schools um uh, the uh, the Bunbury festival I was a good I was a good cricketer a really good cricketer um same on the football side but I suppose what I learned at that time which I didn't realize at the time was that it's the environment and the culture of a sport which brings out the best of the athlete, um, the personality. In cricket, I was full of confidence. It was an objective sport. I was able to be myself. I was captain of most of the teams I played in. Um, as a footballer, I was the opposite. I was quiet. I had no affinity to the environment necessarily. I was a very good footballer. I went to Southampton as a, signed a, a professional contract as an 18-year-old, having been there since the age of 12 or 13. But I never felt at ease in that environment. And I played, I think I played 18, 19 Premier League appearances, but never fulfilled my potential, never felt myself. And which was a pretty unsatisfactory period of my life. Have you been able to pinpoint what it was about that cricket environment that made you comfortable in the football environment, which made it hard to... There's a bit of objectivity and subjectivity. So the more that I personally go, toward, I personally go towards an objective environment, I feel more, more comfortable with it. Um, the subjectivity of football probably did me no favours. I was a, I was a, I'd been considered an overthinker. Um, I'm very considered, and I, I think through all the issues and the challenges, maybe that wasn't necessarily the right personality for football at the time in the 80s and into the 90s. I used to think that silly and happy was the best way to approach the game, um, and I was probably the opposite. So I just think I was in the wrong place. And okay, I did okay. I played some games, got one Premier League goal, which I'll, you know. I mean that's a, that's a that's a that's a big pride of, but it was only one. Um, it's one more of, than most of us. <laughs> yeah, one perfect maybe. Yeah, one more than most. But I, I should have done so much more as a cricketer. I look back and if I'd been a cricketer, I'd have, been, I'd have absolutely nailed it because I just it suited me. You're in that environment, you can talk. You're yourself, and that's one of the things I've taken into my my coaching career was the environment and making everyone the best version of themselves, and it's how they feel. It's how they feel, not what, not what it is, not the technical, the tactical, but it's how they feel. And that environment where everyone can be themselves, it's a different type of diversity, it's personality diversity. Yeah. So I learned very early that environment had a bigger impact than anything else you could do, but whether it's tactical, technical, attitude. I would have the perfect personality rather than the perfect attitude because a perfect attitude, you can, an imperfect attitude, you can, you've got the stick in the carrot. You can drive an athlete, a player, a team member. You can't change the personality necessarily. Or, or you know, th this phrase, you know, leopard just doesn't change its spots. Well, it does in a different environment. So you, you've, got, you've got to get the environment right. So I learned very early about that with my own, my own experiences. But I signed for Southampton. I spent seven years there. Went on to play briefly for Bristol City. I went to Greece, played in Athens in the European Cup Winners' Cup, which was a great experience in '99 started to have all sorts of issues with, with injury. Didn't realise it was neural damage. Um, I retired at 26, um, totally dissatisfied with my, my lot, what I'd achieved, and I just fell into coaching. I, I hadn't ever one day wanted to be a coach throughout my whole career. I had no affinity to the environment. No one, Alan Ball maybe, Alan Ball, which 
brought something out of me really of a couple of very good coaches at Southampton in terms I look back in terms of discipline and process and some really good people there but it wasn't it was I fell into this this role at Bath University literally fell into it and they were starting a football program there in 99 I didn't know what to do next I just happened to bump into the director of sport Jed Roddy and within a day I've decided to become a coach and start this program it was called Team Bath and it became it became we had a football team and it wasn't the football that got me to do it. It was the the enterprise. It was the do something from scratch. The do something it's the antithesis of football. Yeah, no 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 supporters, no boardroom, no just do something it's pure football, pure development. And it was a beautiful environment to work in. It was the best apprenticeship you could ever have. You know, all these different sports mixing with fantastic coaches from Olympic sports. And there was me there trying to cobble together a football team with a blank blank canvas and see what you can do and it wasn't about the football it was about culture environment and learning just happened then I managed to win a few games actually won four promotions did pretty well um and had the opportunity to go to Exeter in 2006 I didn't actually want to go I wanted to stay at university I loved it there but I didn't really want to become that that coach with a drink problem and rosy cheeks sat in a an office like you see in these American movies some guy's been a you know the football coach for 26 years I thought better do this you've got to get on sometimes you know you've just got to do it that transition when you you've been in an environment that you struggled with you then have a career-ending injury for you know at an age of 26 which is really young that that kind of shift in mentality for you but also that's your career like that you know that's your job how did you manage to to deal with that and get over it it's about people in an environment you learn about yourself you realize in what environment you function best um i'd already i suppose i'd always not resented, but I'd missed the opportunity to go to university. So I wanted to go and, and experience that. So great to get paid as a coach doing that. And I had no career plan. I wasn't looking to become a coach. I wasn't looking to go into the professional game. I just wanted to enjoy my life. I wanted to meet good people and just, and I think that's the key to forget the career plan, just have a good life and enjoy yeah. what you do, have a purpose. And I had a purpose for the first time in 10 years, every day, I'd get, I think one thing you do, the, 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 the bombshell, the thing you discover that hits you hard when you stop playing football is that six o'clock happens twice a day. And you suddenly realise that, wow, I've got, you know, there's more than just being a footballer here. And I loved it, you know. So it was, it was just a wonderful opportunity to transition. And I had no plan. I just loved the environment I was in. So did you find a comfort in management that you, like immediately, that you didn't have yeah. in the dressing room? Yeah, Control, really? control. Everyone says it's the worst thing to be a manager. You've got no control. I'm the opposite. I can control more things in there than I could ever as a player. So you control the narrative. You control the tone. You control. I mean, you can pick what you control within reason. So what I didn't realise at Bath University, then at Exeter, that the autonomy that I had that I'd never get again. I knew I had it, but I didn't realise the level of autonomy. So if you talk about control and being able to being able to plot your destiny day by day. I mean, in football, to have 20 years of that was just, I mean, what a, what a privilege. So I had the autonomy and the accountability. I don't mind that. I give it, yeah, bring it on. I want as much as that as I possibly can. That program at Bath University, Team Bath, the first year we had a vision, uh, Jed and myself had a vision to produce this sort of second chance for footballers. Within a year, we realised that wouldn't happen. Because you, you suddenly go into something. I think that's business, isn't it? You, yeah. you start a business, you think it's going to be something, and what it becomes is something alongside it. And that was a really good example. We thought it would be something, and then we realised, actually, let's just win games. Because what you realise is the best platform for business is winning, and they've got to go side by side. So we just started winning games and, and trying to produce the best players we could. And by definition, the best players produce the best team with direction and that's what we did. So it became a very different model that we started with, and it was a fantastic model. I mean, it wasn't for the 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 structures of the pyramid. It would have kept going. It would have been a football league team. And how was it then when Exeter when Exeter come knocking? When you take over at the lowest point, you know, they're in the national league, not actually even in the football league, and you get the opportunity to go and take that yeah. that project on. Talk to us about how that kind of comes about and, and how you make those decisions to, to go judge yeah, good, on that project. Yeah, good question. I mean, I, again, I didn't really want to leave Bath University because I, I was loving it. So, but I thought I had to leave. Um, I bumped into Steve Perryman, 
socially. Um, and I was in New York on holiday. I got a call from Steve saying, do you fancy Alex Inglethorpe had just gone to Spurs? Do you fancy interviewing for the job? They had plenty of, plenty of applicants, I think. I said, yeah, okay. So but I was on holiday. So I actually came back from holiday from the airport, rocked up in flip-flops and shorts to the interview. They put it back a couple of days for me. I was very open-minded. Um, and it's probably the best interview I've ever been on, not from me personally, but from the, 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 the employers, because they defined very quickly um, what the job was and what the purpose of the club was. And even if they didn't know it themselves, it's, it's, it was just perfect in terms of understanding the future. So there were four people in the room, um, so four questions. The first question was the chair lady at the time. Um, I think her question to me was, um, so if you get the job, Paul, will you move to Devon? I said, yes, next question. I didn't move in 12 years, but that's another story. So <laughs> next question. There was, a, there was a supporter on the board that asked me another sort of nonsense question in a way because, you know, who knows what the future should hold. So moved on. I was getting married in a few months' time on a Friday. So I said, look, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to miss the game because uh, I'm getting married. And the chairman at the time, or the chap called Julian Tyke, who was really Mr. Exeter, he said to me, are you sure about that? And I said, yeah, it is. It's, it's November the 3rd. I'm getting married. He said, no, are you sure you want to get married? So kind of really, I thought, this guy's got, this guy's got some, got, got, got humor. I can work with this guy. So there we are, three questions gone. And now we're on to Steve Perryman. It's the last question. So he said to me, Paul, are you winner or costs or not? Or I'm thinking, crikey, talk about polarizing opinion. That's, that's the best question I've ever been asked in an interview. And I sort of said, well, actually, I'm not. So I sort of almost get out of my chair thinking I'm going to get out here and walk out because what, fo what potential football manager would say he's not in it to win? I mean, it could be further from the truth, but the actual question is brilliant. So I said, well, actually, I'm not. Um, I'm about developing players. Better players win games. So it's not the outcome, it's the process. It's, so that could be me, I'm out, I'm afraid. He said, no, that's the answer we want. And why it was so good is because it immediately sets the compass. Um, so I asked a few questions next. You know, what about promotion? Uh, yeah, if you can get promoted, great. But what about relegation? Well, if you can try not to get relegated, that'd be great. So what do you, what, what do you want to be as a club? We want to be the next crew. Because crew obviously have been this wonderful development club for years. And they said, actually, we want to be better than crew. Okay, that works. So to get the league... To get the style of football, all they wanted to do was create this development. It was a cash flow business, so they've yep. been in CBA, no, no overdraft, everything's cash flow. They've got to pay the wages every month. They had a terrible discipline record previous to that. Um, not with Alex, not with Eamon Dolan, but previous to that, getting relegated from the, a terrible discipline record. So one of the, one of the sort of non-negotiables where the team has to be well-disciplined. Um, and that's okay for me. I mean, I've managed a thousand matches and never been yellow carded. And I was the manager, the team reflects the manager. So I'm thinking that's absolutely going to be fine. And that was it. It was just develop talent because we have to create asset. And that's our way of a quantum shift. If we're going to grow the business, it's got to be win for money. And win for money will come with a TV game or young players. When you're in the National League, like, what are the kind of rough budgets that you have to work with as a club? We only talk about Exeter. I mean, we used to get 100,000 investment per year from the supporters that all paid their money that obviously it's a committee run club and it's 100 percent fan owned they pay their money it was a hundred thousand pound issue a year coming into the club that's it so everything has to work on a hundred thousand pounds um so the surplus the profit goes back into the into the playing squad sensibly so over a period of time that's why it's about the economic the, the job of the manager at exeter was it's much about the economic cycle and plotting where you are on that cycle and how much you're prepared to risk for reward along the way, but staying within that sort of cash flow business. Yeah. So let's just say, let's just say that that at that time the national that national league budget was a million pounds, but that had to cover coaches, bonuses, player salaries. It was, and that was the remit of the, the manager to to manage that budget. Yeah. And of course, as we went up and we got more successful, that budget rose, but it also it also dropped immediately the, the day we didn't sell a player. So I think almost every window we sold players. And our best team, which was up to 2011, there was a year, I think it was 2011, we didn't sell a player and it just crashed. Really? And it was the one time we took a chance. We were, 
We ended up in League One, one point off the playoffs in League One. It was the best team I produced. We we finished one point short, and there was a you know a board decision that January to not sell a player in January and go for the promotion because it was a once in a generation maybe opportunity to get promotion. We missed by one point. Um, we had four or five players left on free transfers, and it took me three years to recover the economic cycle. Because you didn't sell really one player in that window that would have yeah. been wow. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I think and, and that's and that's that's the line a club like that. So when people talk about you know how difficult it is to manage the different levels, try doing that. Try try twelve years working on a cash flow business when it, when when you're being judged at five to five on a Saturday in the league table, but actually. It's all about paying the wage at the end of the month and growing the business. Because I think I just reading into it, I saw you, you spent about something around 200,000, let's say, on players in your time there, which is incredible. And you generated, I think, just under 15 million in returns for the club. When, when you sold a player, did that kind of come straight? Was that fed right back into the club? Or was it kind of held to be able to finance that as a security? How did that work when you did have a windfall, I guess? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And that's exactly how I used to, I used to report and present to the board every month. Once a month, I presented to the board. And it was always started with cash and money. It had to, because that was the business. It was that, that type of business. In theory, the, the equation was we took some money in in a transfer fee, and we split it a third, third, and third. Third to the playing budget, third into the club, and third back to the academy. But going back into the playing budget, you can't put it all on the same year because at the end of the year, if you put it all in, you, you, hit, you hit another, you, you hit a cliff edge, and we hit a cliff edge, momentum starts. So we used to then split that over three years. So actually, if you think about it, really, it's only a ninth of that of that fee is going into this year's budget, and then a ninth into the next year budget. So. I remember selling Matt Grimes to Swansea for 1.75, which kicks off our new economic cycle. So in my mind, I'm selling him for 1.75 million. But in my mind, it's only 600,000-ish coming into my budget. It's split over three years. But it was enough to kick off the cycle. So that's the theory. But the reality is you had a group of people, and it's about trust, and it's about working together, and it's about being open and being able to have the debate. So... Going to the boardroom once a month, I was able to debate it. Um, We'd have our arguments. But you can say, look, this is the time to take a chance. This is the time not to take a chance. Um, When it came to those those sales, that was left with myself and Steve Perriman. Um, There would come a point where we would go back to the board, but we were so close to the product. We were so close to the industry, so close to the players. I suppose that only happens when there's trust and you earn that over a period of time, and you have a manager and a director of sport that have the best interests of the club at all times, which is unique. It must be like, such a conflict for you because oh. you, know, you, you use like a you use an Ollie Watkins. You must be so excited. You have a player of that quality. I'd imagine you can identify that you know relatively early. And from that stage, you know eventually when you decide to to sell or, or you have to sell, you're going to get a very good fee for it. But at the same time, the club is always going to have an ambition and it's always going to want to achieve on the pitch. And you need the best players to do that. So, I guess you know my my question is: is do you have a moment where you've got a great player and you go right? This is our time to sell. We'll agree on this now, so we don't. Have have to maybe argue it down the line this is the kind of fee we would take but we'll hold firm if we don't believe true market value is kept even if it's a lot of money i think it's so nuanced one thing i'd say is you don't always decide when you sell actually you know the first phone call would come in to steve or myself is such and such for sale every player's for sale um okay how much do you want we'll know when we hear it because we're never going to give a price for a player. So you, you always start with, and we never had, because it was a cash flow business and we were happy sitting on that line, we never had to sell ever. We never had to sell once, actually. Um, I think that was January 2013 we saw. Only time we saw what we had to. Other than that, we never had to sell. So, But then there comes a point where the dynamic of the player is, is, is future. You can't promote development helping the players get to a high level if you then don't allow them to get there because all you're doing is setting yourself up for the wrong environment for the next player so you've got to get the balance had that information gone to the board the pressure would have mounted too quickly so i think with matt grimes for example the first offer we had from swansea was at three or four hundred thousand seven weeks later i finally went to the board with that at about one and 1.2 1.3 million 
it went up for seven weeks. Um, and again, you know, if we're talking about having a, a plan that you work with, you've got to change, you've got to navigate because every year is different. That was the only time that I actually sold the sell on at the time. So I'd asked for 1.5 million for seven weeks from Hewitt to Swansea. It went from 300 up and up and up and up. Um, so Matt's still at Swansea now doing really well. Yeah. Um, I'd asked for 1.5. I'd asked for 1.5 plus 20% sell on all the way through. He finally came and said, right, 1.5, 20% sell on. I said, it's 1.75 now. And you as the manager are managing, you, you're handling this negotiation. I did that all. I did that all. And I didn't take, I hadn't taken it to the board at that point. Because I know if I took it to them at 500,000, 600, they would have taken it because the pressure to take it. So I just kept it myself. Steve and I kept it. Is that unusual in the yeah. early football? Yeah, completely manager? Yeah. unusual. But it was, a, it was a moment in time. It was completely different. What I did do for those seven weeks is I took every Tuesday off work for seven weeks to take the call from Swansea. So I'd sit at home, sit in my study at home, left the football to the football people at back at the club, and I'd wait for the phone call. I'd prepare for the phone call. I'd, I'd plan what I was going to say to Hugh when he called. And it was a seven-week process. We did, we, I think we spoke every Tuesday for seven weeks. We took it to that point. But I knew at that moment that 250000 was more important than jam tomorrow, some sell-on in six, seven years' time. So that moment, we gave up the, the sell-on in order to get the money because we needed it then. With Ollie Watkins, it was the opposite. With Ollie, we turned down more money from Derby than Brentford offered us. But the reason for accepting Brentford was one, because I understood the data and the styles of the team that would suit Ollie. And I thought that the 15% would be more valuable on Ollie in the future. So we turned down more money from Derby to take the Brentford option because I knew it would suit him. So that's 15% sell on clause, is it, that you insert? Yeah, or 20. I'd be amazed if there are sales that don't include that. I mean, almost all of them include that. So that's an extra, really, uh, what would that be, about f probably 5 million or so that Exeter received then when he moves to, to Aston Villa, which is huge for the club because that's money not accounted for at the time. Absolutely, yeah. So if I, you know, if I look at the by 12 years at Exeter, bearing in mind that the, the, the standard playing budget was about a million, but it rose maybe up to two with success and back down. So, I mean, two, 2014, we were actually at 700,000. We went to two million and back because you're just dealing with surplus. The playing budget is the surplus. And so hence why the Matt Grimes thing was so important. But, you know, you are, yeah, it, it, it moves. And if I consider those 12 years as a whole and add it all up, in terms of the amount of playing budget that I spent, and that's, that's not, not talking about transfer fees, we're talking about the players' salaries, the coaches' salaries, against the money we received, zero spent. So zero spend in 12 years. So you, money we took against every penny we spent on performance, zero spend. What's the difference then between Exeter as a you know, fan, community trust, should we say, run club and a, a privately held entity in the league? What, what can you do as a private club, I guess, or, or an individually owned club that you had to, to manage so much more carefully at Exeter? Number one, you cannot lose money. You, you cannot lose money. So number, that's number one. So what... Okay, so what's your job as a football manager? I still actually think it should be this, but it's there are they're, they're sort of variations of this. Understand the business model of the club you're at. If you don't understand the business model, you've got no chance. Second, develop everything. And I mean, not just the team this, this Saturday, but every facility for the future. You've got to keep developing. And third, don't forget to win on Saturday. Now, most of football is the other way around. Now, Exeter were forced into that, of course, because of circumstance, but it's become such a strong model that it just, it, it, if you don't understand the business, the business actually even resonates to making a substitution on 65 minutes. When people want a, a, a lens into what's, what it's like to be a football manager, I say 60 minutes, 60 minutes you're at home. You've gone one nil up in the first half, you're going at half time, you're winning, you're at home. Everyone thinks you're gonna win, supporters, you're at home, you're one nil up, what could go wrong? It's very little you can do at halftime other than talk about the next half because it's the opponent that's got the next move. They're one nil down, they've got nothing to lose, they're away from home. They're gonna make the next the next move. So you can talk about scoring another goal, but you're one nil up. You come out for the second half, the other team score, and it's now one all, fifty-five minutes. That's worse than being nil nil in the emotion of a football stadium. It's worse than being nil nil because you had something, you've now lost it. Supporters want to blame somebody. They want you to make a substitution. It comes around to that 60, 65 minutes. You're going to make a substitution. You're stood there. You're thinking. 
Right, so what happens next? Not what's just gone on, what happens next? You're trying to be clear and you need, you've got, you should hopefully have got a good support staff that are there to prompt you on the things you can't think about because believe me, you can't think about everything and emotion gets to you. Now you've got to make a decision. There's nothing like your relationship with the board at that moment it makes you the best manager you can be. With respect, detach yourself what the supporters are saying. It's your relationship with the board. It makes you bold, it makes you hesitant, it makes you conservative. Whatever it is, that relationship matters. So even down to making a substitution, are we going to go for this and try and win this 2-1? Or are we going to hold on to what we've got? Or what am I going to do as a manager? Am I going to put a young player on? That relationship, that business model dictates everything at the heart of it. You talked about, you know, and you just referenced again there, the model actually relying on the development of those players. Then, When you're kind of creating that talent pool, are you using local talent around? Uh, Is it coming from areas or are you pooling it then from, you know, clubs that are releasing a huge amount of talent and you've got a great scouting network or system that enables you to bring them in and really develop them? Well, if you can imagine over 12 years, it changed a lot. Again, this is is another thing. I'll come back to that in a sec. This is another thing. People talk about your model. The, you know, they say, well, what's your your playing style DNA? It, 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 it's got to change because it's not what you do, it's what your opponents are doing. It's where you benchmark against the team teams you're playing against. So if you're a team like Exeter that goes from the National League to the League One, you might be the same, but your opponents are different. And what's your expectation? What's, what's, what's the capability? So unless you have the context of your opponent and what they're doing, what you did two years ago is no longer relevant. So you've got to keep changing. You've got to get talent on the pitch. You've got to make them better. Um, so to say, like, what's your style of play? I mean, every year I had a different style because I had to. You've got to be, you know, survival of the adaptable, not the fittest. And I, it's something I use often because you've got to change. It's the opponent. I think fundamentally there are three types of recruit. There's the academy player coming through. There's the senior player that I would, I would sign and have a, an agreement that we would go through a process of playing to become a coach because added value is huge, especially with young players. So that was a, a fundamental part of, of my model was the senior player, three or four of them, the coaches in the dressing room. And then the others was the round peg, round hole. You still need a right back every now and then and a goalkeeper, and, but they don't fit either of those brackets. So you still need the, the functional signings. There's three there. Um, the value is always in the young player. So you've got to make sure you get best value out of that player. You don't get best value when you lose. You don't get value, best value when you play them all together. You've got to get the balance right. So they're the three fundamentals. Now, in terms of who we could sign, it changed. So when I started at Exeter, we dropped out the Football League. You didn't have rights to the players in the academy. That's the trouble. Is The trouble with the system was that you drop out the league. You lose the rights to the young players just when you need them most. So I think my very first year at Exeter, we lost in the playoff final to Morecambe to go back up to the league. We lost last-minute goal. Um, I think that next day, our four best three or four best academy players all signed for Plymouth the next day. Had we gone to the Football League, they'd have signed for us. We lost them overnight, the best four. Well, I don't believe those four made it, but we began to be the destination club. What I would say, you might find this remarkable, is after my first year, we got rid of all the scouting. I had no scouts for 11 years. No scouting at all. Why? So I worked out pretty, pretty quickly. It was a waste of energy because... If you understand your model, if you understand where you sit in the context of the other clubs, you soon work out that if you spot a right back playing for Aldershot on the environs of London, he's never going to travel all the way to you to get paid less, to get paid less when he can stay in London. So you soon work out what all this wasted energy. So we worked out we had to be the team where the player would come to first or last because you get leverage then. You get some sort of financial leverage in the negotiation. So the players we signed knew they wanted to sign for us right at the start, or they didn't. They tried everyone else and came to us last. And then that became, you're looking at the 5% at either end of the spectrum. So you've got your focus on a fewer number of people. Then we started to strip that down into, this was early, early days, but before the data really kicked in, but we did the same kind of thing that you would do with metrics with data, but we did it with circumstance. We did it with geography. We did it with age. And back in the days when you'd get the PFA list of a thousand names at the end of the season, we break that down to 20 players and focus on those based on had they once lived in the Southwest? Had they visited the Southwest on holiday? Did they have, a, did they have an auntie that lived in Taunton? Yes, that did happen. And we did sign the player based on it. And, you, <laughs> and then honestly, we did. Very good goalkeeper. 
So he had an auntie lived in Taunton, so we went for that player. Honestly, because you're just going to waste your time otherwise. We'd, we'd spent, I think my first summer, we spent all summer contacting all these players. Complete waste of time. So you've got to be, you've got to be lean, you've got to be decisive, you've got to have conviction of what you do, be good at what you are. Mm. So that's how we did it at the start. And then, of course, the data came in and we began to build data systems, which really refined that. But I still think that was my best ever summer, was recruiting the five players based on those metrics that we put together on the back of a back of an envelope. I'm really interested. What do you think? Because we've had, I've seen so much criticism recently of, and we're talking top clubs using their academies as obviously ways to get around, you know, financial regulation, should we say, and and utilizing their youth talent to to be able to then fund them signing kind of foreign talent. How do you how do you view that kind of in the in the broader scope of football and and the value of academies now? I mean, it's such a big industry. There's so many different. But not not one club is the same as the next. So it's. Every club has its own personality, its own way of working. We have some, you know, we have the EPPP has been a brilliant thing for English football. You know, they the up the standard, the way we play. There has been some, I think, some loss to that in terms of the lower leagues, in terms of practicality and, and players who otherwise maybe would have played at lower level and built Ollie, and Ollie Watkins. Will that happen again? I don't know. Um, Ethan Ampadu, who played for us and before we sold him to Chelsea, would he have stayed and played enough? For, I don't know. And I, and I, and I, because we couldn't have afforded to keep him because we would not have had the tribunal. So there's certain things that that's good and bad in the way that the academies work. Every club has its own view on it. Do you know what? I'm not clever enough to be that clever. I kind of just <laughs> know that when you're in a club, I do it for the place. This is a, actually a really good way of looking at it. They put a, they put a microphone in your, in, your, in your face. They ask you a question. There's a question asked by a member of the press. They know the story. They're just after a, they're after a headline from you. As you're talking, you're talking to numerous stakeholders at the same time. You're talking to the team you just played against. You want to be respectful. You're talking to next week's opponent because they're going to try and look at every word you say to try and get some kind of advantage for next week. You're talking to your ownership. You're talking to your supporters. You're talking to the press talking to your players you've got to decide which one of those sits at the top of your list now i do realize that some clubs got to be the owner i do realize that some clubs got to be the supporters exeter it was always the players that was my compass i have to get the, the best out of these players i will not say anything i love them to pieces and they've got to fight for each other next week so it's all about keeping the players the young players on track so you decide within your club, what is the most important thing to focus on? For me there, it was the players. Other clubs, it would be different. Absolutely. So when it comes to the topic of young players, for me, it was that they are always going to produce better performances than you think they can. Always. And you can always think of where this could go wrong. They'll make mistakes. But actually, they always do better than you think they're going to do. You just got to put good people around them, give them less information, don't overburden them with, 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 with responsibility and just get them to do the basics really well. And actually, it's not that clever. You just have to make sure that they know their job and they play their best football and concentrate on the things that they can affect. And I think, I think you know, to develop young players, it's all about environment and good people around this place. Before we take a look at some of the stuff you've been doing more recently, I just, I'm really interested in this because it's something we talk about a lot on the show, which is the building of profile now of individual as much as we build the profile of brand. And what I mean by that is players are becoming their own entities and their own brands as much as the clubs that they play for drive their value. The reason I ask you this is because we joked at the start, but... It's something that I read about you. And obviously, when you, when you were at Exeter, you had this brilliant label you, of the most fashionable man in football. You had an identity. You had something that really kind of stood out from a football crowd. And I, and I read you say, you know, you said, I'm an oddity with what you wear, how you speak, with the choices that you make, how you view your players. And, I, and the question I really wanted to ask is, like, why, why did you think it was, like, what was it about that, that that really brought that personality from you into the game? And how did that influence the management style that you were then able to implement in football in such a unique way? Yeah, there's a couple of really interesting topics there. Number one is being the best version of myself. So I don't, I didn't wear a cravat and a pork pie hat to, yeah, down the motorway in the car. I put it on for match day for my armour. It was, it was my way of, it was my way of stepping up because maybe at the start, Exeter, the fans didn't 
necessarily take to me because I was so studious and considered. I had very little animation in terms of how I conducted myself on the touchline. So maybe I needed something in addition to that. I happened to have a mentor, Ray Kelvin, the founder of Ted Baker, that had that, that had my best interests at heart and was able to help me because I don't think I would have come up with those ideas myself. <laughs> yeah. But it was so so there's there's something about me there. There's something about stepping up is business and this is my cape. And this is not me every day, but this is we're into battle and to put my armor on. So there's something about that and it makes you stronger somehow. Um and I could talk through I could talk through a you know an alias almost. Yeah. So there's that. But there's also the effect it has on the players. I mean, if you think about it, you know, you're, you're going into battle and the players have got to go out, especially if you're Exeter, you're playing in League One against, you know, at the time, Southampton, Brighton, Leeds, Norwich, Sheffield Wednesday, Charlton, some really punchy teams there. How are you, how are you going to go onto that pitch and show confidence if your manager doesn't do it? So I'd sometimes put my stuff, I put my cravat. I remember the first time I wore the cravat, I'm in the service station, put my cravat on thinking, oh my God, what am I doing? What am I doing? Stick, oh, I'm going to walk out the door now and I'm, I'm out. And that's it. There's no going back. But you've got to, if I can't show confidence and stand for something, how can I ask my players to do it? I went to, We once had a game at uh, um, St. James Park against Leeds. It was the year Leeds and Summer Grace, they got promoted. We finished eighth that year, really good year. Um, actually, it was the year before. I think it was 2010, I think it was. And we turn up, we turn up to the game. It's, it's a, it's a, misty rainy day and I'm walking around the pitch to the dressing rooms I think what am I going to say to the players they're top of the league we're struggling they're top of the league tactics techniques I mean look the players aren't going to take it from me they know they're better than us right so what am I going to come up with so I stood there and I said right okay look so the game's going to start in 10-15 minutes you're going to go out into the tunnel you're going to stand in this little concrete tunnel at St James's Park you're going to stand next to this team. They're going to be dressed in white and their kit is going to be perfectly white. We can't get our kit that white. Our socks are always dirty because it's like we don't bring up the, the washing machines to do it properly. But their kit is going to be perfect. They're all going to be three or four inches taller than you. They're going to get paid more money than you. Get used to it. We've got to come up with a plan, right? But when we get out on that pitch and we, we, we toss up and we it's ready for kickoff, look at me. Right, and I'm going to be stood in the technical area and I'm going to have this silk tweed jacket on. I'm going to have my John Smedley jumper. I'm going to have my Ted Baker silk scarf. I'm going to have my Japanese cotton chinos on, my, my brogues, my pantheretta socks. I'm going to be all dressed up. Now, just look at me. We're 1-0 up already, right? Because maybe in the other touchline, the manager's got his tracksuit bombs tucked into his socks. We're 1-0 up. We scored in the first minute. We beat them 2-0. Now, sometimes... I've got to stand there, and there was no tactics. There was nothing more than saying, just stand up for yourself and believe it. And that's what that was about. And you know, I'm dressed in a blooming hoodie and a pair of shorts today. I don't wear a cravat every day. But you've got to come to work and you've got to mean it. You feel right, you think right, you act right. Yeah. That's it. That order. Feel, think, act. Brilliant. So, you know, you, you have, what is it, over, over 500 games as Exeter manager. You know, an incredible kind of 12, 12 year tenure, I think that you, you've then moved on and you've utilized it, these experiences, these skills. What have the last few years been like you've, since you've left Exeter and, and just give us a little bit of a flavor for the projects that you've started taking on? Well, again, I've had no plan. I've had no career plan with Exeter. I stayed there when I could have left. And then we just, it just ran out of steam. I ended up leaving, right? And between the two of us, it just came to an end. But imagine you had teams coming to you, wanting you to take over, and you got offered, I'm sure, some very good jobs. How, as a manager, do you, do you handle that? I just knew that I wanted to be in a place where I wanted to come to work with all the people I was working with, uh, Steve Perryman and Julian Tagg especially, and the players. I just You become attached and it becomes your thing. And I'd go to meet some maybe owners or chief execs at other clubs, and I'm thinking, oh, I can't see myself working with you. I just, uh, I'm not going to get out of bed at five in the morning. So, and the opportunities, I, there's a real peak. 2010, 11, I'm, I'm getting phone calls every week. But then they start to, to peter away. And during 2014, 15, 16, hardly any. Well, that's because we were struggling in the league, but that was still my most successful time at Exeter because I'm building the new economic cycle, but no one's going to recognise that. But people begin to think he's never going to leave, so they don't ask. So then you're left in a position where I'm thinking, I'll be here for 25 years. I honestly couldn't see myself leaving. And then a strange set of circumstances happen. It just... 
I can't even believe it still happened, but it did. And in my mind, I was going to be there forever. But it, it, everyone sort of gets tired of each other, maybe, and it, circumstances happen. And then you leave. It feels like divorce, you know. Someone asked me the other day about starting at MK Dons the next week. I had no plan to go to MK Dons. I mean, people at Exeter still think I, I lost a playoff final in order to go to MK Dons. I mean, could, I mean could, what football people think. I mean, I'm trying to win at Wembley against Coventry. All I can think about is winning. And then somehow it all falls to pieces the next couple of days. And I've left. And I go to MK Dons. I think it's, the analogy was getting divorced. That happens. You're then left completely, utterly lost. And then your best mate your agent or whoever it is says, I think you're another wife. And four days later, you're stood, you're sat at your wedding, giving a speech about how much you love your new wife. Four days later, that's the reality of it. That's what it felt like. Yeah. And then you go into this new project and it's complete. And I knew it would never be that exit. I knew I'd never have that again. So you're having to work out what's next. You're just thinking so quick. How does the owner think? What's the dynamic here? What's the compass? What's the context? And you're trying to work it out really quickly because it's never going to be the same as your last club. And then it, that really was the start of it. We got instant promotion at MK Dons, which is fabulous for me. A year later, six months later, we lost a few games. I'm gone. Anyway, that's how it works. Yeah. And then the pandemic. And I, this merry-go-round you get as a football manager, I've never been off the merry-go-round in 20 years. The day I fall off bloody merry-go-round, the merry-go-round stops. So there's now six to nine, 12 months with no movement in football. I'm off it for the first time and the bloody thing stopped. So that was the start of the end of being a manager. And someone said, why have you, cho why have you chosen to not be a manager? I didn't choose. Like I didn't choose to be a manager in the first place. Circumstances happen. And then the jobs I want, I can't get. The ones I don't want, I get offered. And then you think, I can't get on my life here. I've got to come up with something really quickly. And I then dig into all the things I've learned, all the things that I've done at Exeter. I start to write and I write. I have a partner with me helping me write something. The intention was a leadership business, but actually we just wrote every twice a week. We wrote two years. And then what you do is you start working out. I'm good at that. That's what I was good at. That's how I understand. And, and then quickly you just, again, no plan. You just start to build momentum and then things start happening. So all the things I've, all the things that's happened in the last two or three years is off that. I didn't go on the golf course. I didn't wait for the phone to ring. I just got on with it and just started digging into all my experiences. And you've run, I mean, there have been some fascinating projects. Can you give an insight into working with some of these bigger clubs like Fulham and the Crystal Palace in the capacity that you have been, where you've been working across the youth side, the data programs, the you know hiring systems when it's come to managers, et cetera. How, how have they utilized those skills and experiences that you've had in the game to deliver for them? Yeah. In ways? These football clubs, the people within it see, see me as a very interesting character because I've got such a broad skill base. I haven't got anything particularly clear that they understand. So when, whenever you go into a club, I found as a consultant for football clubs, for ownership, for, um, for these football clubs across all sorts of leagues, is that it's got to start on something specific. If I go in and just say, a bit like I did as a manager a few times, yeah, don't worry, I'll work that out. And that, that's not going to be good enough. It comes across as a bit arrogant, which I look back on some of the interviews I did and maybe, maybe it came across that way. You know, hire me, come in, I'll work that out. It's easy. Well, you got to you got to give them some reason that's more specific than that. And I've learned that, and I think you got there has to be something specific. Data is a really, really, I mean, it's, clearly it's it's something that needs significant in the in the industry. So, and I've got a really unique view on that, and a really unique model that I've created for that. So, that's often a really good place to start, as well as developing coaches. So, there's two parts to it that I've sort of started this consultancy with be it um, Global Football Holdings, which, but they've got a multi-club model and I've helped them over a number of years now with projects at different clubs. And it tends to be a performance audit. It tends to be development of academy. It tends to be a, a data research. It tends to be philosophies. It's, it could be a number of things. Um, and if I had to pick on two, it's one, it's the data. And it's, look, I've got a very specific view of data it's, it's essential i was doing it before most people i think and in fact i was <laughs> bath university 2002 sports co dropped a lab into bath university 
tried to get a few people to get good on it so they could sell the product with someone. I, I was in a room with with um, Mike Baker, who's now Gaths, what's Gaths, um, Southgate's analyst with England. We learned together in 2002. So I was doing it really early. I actually coded football matches in 2002. I didn't want to be an analyst. I wanted to be a coach. I actually worked out really quickly. I couldn't use it for coaching. It just didn't work. So I had to come up with my own model. So that's another story. So be able to take data and make it work. Because the problem we have is, is more and more data. And it's all in isolation. And putting it all together and translating it for football people is the craft. And less is more. So you're not looking at 100 pages every Monday. You're looking at two. Because so you need, you need to understand what data you need. So that's, that's one thing. And the other thing is what I call the essence of coaching, which is... Look, everyone's searching for a magic key. Is it 433? Is it 442? Is it, if there was one way of winning, we'd all do it. So it's not about the 433, the 352. It's about how you do it. It's the essence of leadership and getting players to think correctly. So I've, you know, I've spent the last three or four years putting together what I call the essence of coaching, which is a how-to guide of building relationships, communicating, uh, driving performance, leading by example, all the things which you go on an FA qualification don't necessarily talk about, but I think it is the fundamental part of coaching because players often find their own solutions. And I know there are better players and, and, and poorer players, but actually if we assume every player is the same, the difference is going to be how they feel and how they play together and their connection and do they all think the same thing at the same time? And that's coaching. So... I've sort of gone into a lot of these projects with a, um, a more conceptual view of coaching and added value in terms of philosophies of an academy. Um, and again, add to the E triple P concept, which is a fabulous one, but still, how do you define selectability within that? Because we're talking about, you know, a romantic view of development, which is there, but then when it comes to translating that into, is that player selectable for the coach? That is the key. And I think that's something which I've really tried to do over the last two or three years. So we, we hear data so much. It's become more and more a part of sport. You know, you can't really escape it now. I think it's really confusing as a fan or, or even just as an outsider to understand how it's actually used and leveraged to, to make the right decisions. So, you know, when if you're working for Fulham and you're running these data programs within, let's say, a academy recruitment structure, if you're working with Crystal Palace to use it to bring a new manager in, what are the kind of, you said less is more, what are the key pointers that you're looking at from a data perspective on those sides to make decisions? I think the, the, the fundamental problem is that the conversation starts with the data. So they'll, you'll pick up some kind of metric and that will be everything you look at then. It's the player's speed, the player's possession, whatever it is. And the, I mean, 20 years ago, it was one page of data on a Monday, now it's 100. So, but the conversation started with the data. So. I had, this, I had this, this journey with data where I tried it for three or four years. I just literally gave up. I thought, I'd have to start again because I can't translate this to players. And I can't, and more importantly, I can't decide which is the bit I need to be looking for in order to improve my team in two weeks' time. Forget two years. I've got two weeks to win a game. So what, what can I do? So I, I actually spent six years doing this. I spent six years every single game at Exeter. I used to watch it in slow motion, make notes. And I used to look like were high value moments, things that never actually happened, but we made my heart just skip a beat. Oh my God, we're going to concede or, oh, we could have scored. And I did this for six years. And off the back of that, it was about how do I then break the game down into something that a player and a manager will understand instantly. So forget the data. Let's start with the structure. So we came, I came up with a structure that could be coached in the National League and the Premiership, no different. And the metrics that define those structures. Then I looked at those moments. So we, we know that there's, you know, across football, there's a dozen shots per game per team, that four of those hit the target, that 1.5 1, 1. of those go in the net. Across football, we know those. So you're, you're always dealing with, to improve my team, is it a quantity thing or frequency thing that I'm, I want to improve, or is it a quality thing, or a bit of both? You don't always have the opportunity to do both. You've got to improve your quality with a better goalkeeper, or you're trying to take 12 shots to 13 shots per game. So it's one or the other. And that's enough, by the way, to take from 12th in the league to 6th. So which one are you trying to do? So you, you're working all this out. And then, so you've got all this, all this, but if you dig into that data too soon, you take yourself on a, off on a tangent and you go too far off, 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 off piste and you can't get back on. 
So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take the game itself and, and the game itself is what I use to translate for the manager. Then I try and find the high value moments. And I've got my own algorithm for that, that I developed. And 10 years ago, um, I was told that it was too simple and it was sort of bit, it was a bit basic. And believe it or not, 10 years later, I'm now being approached by companies asked, can we build a model or product based on your structure? Because, you know, okay, this is a really simple way of looking at it. Who controls the game of football? Is it the team with the ball or the team without the ball? Well, it's actually both. The team with the ball has the decision where to play it. But the team without the ball decides whether they have a high line, a deep line, narrow, wide. And wherever they stand, the team with the ball will play. So if, if, if the team has a high line, you go behind them. If they drop off, you play in front of them. So the impact of the team without the ball is huge. So I built a model based on the team without the ball. So it was a very basic model. If you, if you, if you, know, how to, if you know how to defend, you can coach attacking. Ten years later, ten years ago, it was told it was pretty basic. Now everyone wants to see a bit of it, and I'm using that, whether it's academy players, whether it's doing a performance audit on a new club that's just been purchased, whether it's whether it's identifying the style of a manager, because there are lots of good managers out there and lots of good clubs, but putting the two together is the tricky bit. So it's not which manager just won the league; it's which one suits the style of a, a, a player that this team has or this set of supporters will allow because some teams ha have to play in a certain way by the environment y y they play in and the players within it the high value players you've got to get the right manager to get the best out of the high value players because they're your assets so there's so many nuances here so it's all about alignment that's what i'm really interested in because you know the crystal palace is is it's a great like case study just in understanding this you know you mentioned there that it's not you can't go data too early so you know when when you're looking at that you're you're assessing an oliver glasner and you're looking at the environments around it and then once you're happy with the the, the tick boxes should we say and temperament and and personality and cultural fit is that the time where you go right data where do where do we where do we dive into? How does he fit within the playing structure that we have now? So is it still, when you go through that process, was it still secondary for a manager as well as it was for a player? I and mean, I've been advising. I haven't been making those decisions, which has been yeah. quite nice. I've been able to advise. But exactly that. I think, I think you've got to go to a point where in all of these challenges, whether it's a point of a new manager, signing a player, bringing a young talent up from the academy, what you're saying is there should be a number of boxes that we tick that, makes that player selectable or that coach um, fit with this club. And I think then you have it, then you break that down and that's all being, okay, we agree on that. Now let's look at the nuance and, and which bit are we going to look at? And then your, your decision-making is based on, I suppose, what you decide at the time is important. Are you trying to stay up in the league? Are you trying to get promoted? Are you trying to, are you, are you trying to optimize the assets of your best talent. Which bit is it now, right here, right now, that we're going to concentrate on? Or was it all of them? Because actually concentrating on all of them is quite hard. Yeah. So I think and that's when the data bit comes in. But if you if you understand the rhythm of a game, the, 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 the momentum in a game, and that's where I actually pitch my data collection, is the rhythm of a game of football. I watch it through, I can watch it through blurred eyes. I'm not looking at the detail, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the rhythm of the game of football and where the high value moments come, who's creating them, who's moving, um, and how does the manager dictate and influence that? Because honestly, we, you know, because at Exeter, I had 11 years, I, and you know, it's no different in League One as it is at the top level. You know, there's different zeros when it comes to salaries and players like a bit bigger and stronger. But you know, when you're looking at the when you're looking at the game, you can see in the data the way the team's being coached. I had 11 years at Exeter playing against opponents, play, playing playoff semi-finals where I never watched the opposition play. I had a scout that watched the opposition. We did it all on data, what the outputs were. I could give you, I put my mortgage on what that manager coached and what he didn't coach. Based on based on my metrics and the feedback, I could, I could categorically say that coach does not coach that based on the outputs over a season of football. So it sets a tone, it gives you a framework by which then dig into one bit of data that you might need to win the game. So you're not looking at a thousand bits of data you've identified already, we have to stop them doing this and we have to try to do this to win. And then you put all your focus on those things.
I can't believe whether you want to or not is interesting. Um, but the way you speak and, and how you analyse the game and, and all the different things you bring into it, that it's not absolutely perfect for a modern football structure. I can't believe that you know a team wouldn't be looking for a manager like yourself to come in and implement this. Is this now a different part of your career, you know, in all seriousness, where you're like, do you know what, actually, I love, I love a bit of the diversity of what I can do. I love applying it in different ways. I love the freedom to take projects on that I just couldn't do if I was in that responsibility again of picking a team week in, week out and looking after a group of players? Oh, God, I think about this all the time. I, I don't know. I've never had a plan. I just want to work with the best people I can work with. And it comes a point where it's not my choice. You know, it's not my choice anymore. You know, I have to I have to build a career for myself. I'm only 51. I've got another 15, 20 years, hopefully, in football. I, I don't feel satisfied and fulfilled. I don't feel I've ever, I've ever achieved what I should achieve. So I'm just, I, I've got so much motivation to do better it'll be someone else's choice in what capacity um all i know is that i i feel capable of doing it in, in a number of different roles i do miss coaching you know 1100 games in i miss it i miss the monday to friday i miss the dynamic of the players the relationships creating optimal performance i, I miss that so much uh, the decision making the speed of decision making that building a team that can make quick decisions the 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 frustrating thing when you're in other roles is that you're not close enough to products. There's no other position in a football club that can change product in two minutes, like the manager. Half-time team talk, just nail it. And that's frustrating for me. I used to love that conviction and speed of decision-making. Um, but who knows what's around the corner? You know, I'm, I'm, I've tried to set up businesses. I've got, I've got a you know, physiotherapy business at the core in London. I've got this how-to guide, essence of coaching. I've got these things that I'm trying to build, which I'm not going to sit back and just let it dictate to me. But on the other hand, I just love the sport so much. I love the players. This is about, for me, it's about players and what role can I have that gives them the best chance? And that's, that's the most fulfilling of all. Look, Paul, I think that's a lovely lovely way uh, to wrap it up it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you it's so interesting hearing all of these different angles so i really appreciate you coming on and sharing it with us not at all thank you for having me